what, what the haters talking about. Yeah. What's up, family? Uh, brand new show, brand new guest, brand new topic. Right now, going in with Loki Mahullen. He is a native of Virginia and an award-winning filmmaker and dun, 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 the son of civil rights icon, Joan Mahullen, whom I am very honored to have on the show, fam. She has put in the work you did. Uh, Loki has won multiple film awards and he has received over 30 telly awards for his various work in commercial industrial films. Uh, now, his legendary mother has taken parts in uh, a number of uh, sit-ins and protests and boycotts, you name it, she has put in the work and she's on the show also. We're going to have a heavy show tonight, fam, and we're going to get right into it. Uh, welcome to the show, Loki. Welcome to the show, Joan. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, I, I think I, I have to... For starters, I mean, I, I mean, I, I got to have Joan on this show, man. You show you, you definitely blessed me to have on the show. So I want to, I want to ask her just straight up. First question that comes to mind, like, at what age, or maybe it was a a, a point in time, did you, like, a light come on and and you said, something ain't right about this racial situation in America, and I'm gonna do something about it. I was 10 years old, down visiting grandma in Oconee, Georgia, the old company log in town, not the fancy resort. And when my playmate and I snuck off and went through the colored, that was the light turned then part of town, you know what we really called it. And I saw the school for the colored students. It was a shack, an absolute shack. There was a um, hot belly stove, you could see the heat. The door was a little bit ajar. There was no glass or screens in the window. There was no running water or electricity. There was a pump out in the yard for water. No playground equipment, no grass, no nothing and one outhouse for all the students. That was awful. This was before Brown versus Ford, and I knew out the other end of town was the fanciest building for miles and miles around, a mm -hmm. brand new brick schoolhouse for the white kids. And I knew this was not treating people the way we wanted to be treated, like we learned in Sunday school. And I resolved then, couldn't put it in words, but I knew when I had the chance to do something to make the South, didn't care about the Yankees, they could take care of themselves, but to make the South the best it could be for everybody there, I would seize the moment. And that came in 1960 with the sit-in. And being a white woman from the South, a lot of people thought that you were mentally ill because you wanted equality for all Americans. How crazy is that? Crazy enough to get you put in jail a few times. Death Row, that was the Freedom Riders. Well, that was actually an improvement with the Freedom Riders. They just kept it coming, kept it coming. And it got in the white women's cell where there was less than three square feet of floor space per prisoner. Mm -hmm. Now think about sleeping in that. And so when they moved to Parchman, they were trying to frighten us, but I'm a Southerner, I knew their game. And it was so much roomier, food was better, it was cleaner. So being put on death row had its, its good side. I mean, we knew they weren't going to kill us, but um, it, it was a nicer place to stay for a couple of months. Back then, anybody coming down to work in civil rights came out to Tuberu College, where I was a student. Um, it was ground zero in the civil rights movement in Mississippi. And they 
we just sort of took turns on so many people of telling them what they needed to know, the white ones and the black ones too, but particularly the white ones, what you need to know if you're gonna be working on civil rights down there. Mm -hmm. And um, we just sort of took turns to it and it just ended up being my turn to give him and his wife, you know, the basic orientation. And I know there is nothing I could have said that would have made any difference. And so I feel I always have to do a little bit extra for the stuff he can't do. And so, then um, that guy who was with us, um, they were both out of campus all the time. I knew them both. That's, those are the three that were killed to stop Freedom Summer from happening. But yeah. actually, about two weeks before that, they tried to kill my mom and her friends because she lived her friends died. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so Loki, you, yeah. first of all, congratulations on the numbers that you're running up on Amazon with your, new, with your film, oh, uh, thank you. The Uncomfortable Truth. At what point did you know that I don't have a regular mom? Like, <laughs> something, there's something different about her, but not just different about her, but her, her spirit or whatever, but it, you know, it's something special about her that's, that, that goes beyond just being my mom. Uh, right. she, she doesn't just belong to me. She right. belongs to the world. You know, and, and that's, that's an interesting thing to say because it's, uh, I, I've had that conversation a lot with uh, Rena Evers, who's the daughter of Medgar Evers and Merle Evers. Medgar, who was the first of the three martyr leaders, of Medgar, Martin, and Malcolm. Right. But uh, we, we've, we've talked about that in, in respects of, you know, how, to, how do we recognize, I mean, it's, it's, that's just mom and dad, or that's just mom. Um, and at the same time, like you said, I mean, it's like, yeah, but it, it's, uh, she's, she's also, you know, uh, the world, right? Um, and, and really, it came when I was, uh, when I was actually making the film An Ordinary Hero. And we knew my mom's stories in general. We knew about the pictures, they were there, the, the Jackson sit-ins and the Arlington sit-ins and, and these different things. And civil rights people would come to the house. But uh, that was just kind of like, you know, when people look at that sit-in photo, uh, they, they, they're, they're looking at the- Woolworth. Uh, the Woolworth, Jackson, yeah, Jackson Woolworth sit-in. Yep, yeah. May 28th, 1963. So that's the one with, uh, Ann Moody, my mom, and John Salter, and they're sitting there and they're pouring stuff on her head. And, you know, I think it was it Sugar Mom, is that right? Sugar, yeah, like I was sitting up already. <laughs> and uh, but um, you know, my brothers and I, we would look at that photo and we, we're looking at our glasses and stuff. You know, I mean, because it's like cat glasses, cat eye glasses. That was a style back then. We, we you know we were laughing about those sort of things. Right. Um, but it was when I was making the film and I would call people. Uh, or, or places like the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute to get a photograph. And without fail, every single time, people would say, for Joan, anything. Right. I'm like, wow. I mean, I knew she was like in a sit-in and, you know, and a couple little things like that. I had no idea the impact that she had and what she meant to people and what she represented as a white Southern woman who was, I mean, Tougaloo College, uh, the, she was the first, you know, full-time black student, you know, white student there at the black college. And, and then joined the black sorority. Right. Yeah. Delta Sigma Theta. But the finest. But the, uh, but the state of Mississippi tried to shut down the school because you can't have a white woman on a campus with a bunch of black men. Right. Uh -huh. That just, that's just against every, everything they were fighting for, for segregation. Right. Um, and we got to protect our white women. Uh, you know, from the black beast rapist narrative. And so here she was on campus and they couldn't do anything about it. And it was just flew in the face of everything. And so she was going against every social norm that was expected of her and was willing to put her life on the line for it. Um, right. And so when I would hear that from people over and over and over again, when, when total strangers would walk up and, and thank me for my mom. Like I didn't, you know, I'm like, you understand how this works, right? I didn't make my mom, my mom made me, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, it was like, and then this young and old, not just people who lived under Jim Crow, but generations today are still thanking her for the work that she did. She wasn't the only one, 
right. they recognized that she didn't have to do it either. Now, now let's speak to that, uh, Joan, not having to do it, uh, but feeling obligated to do it as a human being. Uh, Joan, do you ever, uh, are you ever taken aback when black people say, well, well, I don't think you deserve any credit. Your people should have never uh, enslaved us in the first place. You know, like, you know, why should, why should we give you any type of recognition or whatever? Uh, nobody's ever said that to me. Yeah, nobody's ever said that to you? No. Well, we're going to make sure you stay offline because if you are, <laughs> if you are on Instagram or, or, or YouTube or something like that, uh, you know, you know, there, there, are, there are people out there that would go there. Uh, oh, yeah. Personally, but, but personally, you know, I, I will say, since I opened up the can of worms, I will speak on it. I don't think that a person can have too many allies. And, um, and I think for, you know, for, for you know, whatever reason, uh, if, if I identify somebody as a true ally, then that's an ally to me, period. And I, I see no... I see no color when it comes to that. And I'm serious. I mean, I see a color in, in terms of, yeah, that's my, that, that's a white person, that's a black person, you know, that, that's a Mexican, whatever, whatever. I got all of that. But I'm saying to me, you know, one of my favorite sayings is, blood don't make your family loyalty do. Mm -hmm. And I ride for who ride for me. You know, that's the way I rock. And so, uh, I'm always grateful for, for any type of uh, uh, alliance. Uh, I, again, I don't think that you can have too many allies. And you know, I, I'm gonna go out my way right now. Well, it's not really going out of my way, but I'm just gonna say right now, uh, from me to you, thank you for the work that you put in because you didn't have to do it. Uh, and I know it was an unpopular time. Uh, and it's always an unpopular time to go against the grain and to go, and to go against the status quo. And I'm sure that you put your family at risk, you know, many times. What was it like, you know, uh, with having, was, was, was Loki uh, around at the time uh, when you were still involved in the movement? Um, well, the civil rights movement, you know, the student thing, um, pretty much petered out after Freedom Summer, but there was still things happening. Um, some marches, it sort of drifted over to the anti-war movement. But there were some events and um, he got taken down to them, I think, um, some anniversary of the um, March on Washington, he was there and Stokely Carmichael was speaking and I drug him out to the Smithsonian and I drug him and his brother out to meet my old buddy. And can you picture Stokely? You know, well over six feet tall, the most dreaded man in the world to white America in the mid 70s, kneeling on the floor to speak eyeball to white ball to these two little freckle faced white preschoolers and shaking their hands and, you know, making nice conversation. But that was Stokely. And unfortunately, Loki doesn't remember that. But um, if Stokely was your friend from early on, he was your friend, period. And I've heard folks, um, other white folks in the early days of the movement tell of similar stories of him going out of his way to recognize them publicly. So, um, Stokely got involved, I mean, Loki and his brother got involved in sort of being around civil rights people, and I dragged them off to a couple meetings or something. But we were visiting back and forth in people's homes, everywhere from, you know, Washington, D.C. to Jackson, Mississippi. And so they met a lot of them. Um, and I think that's why they didn't think Mama was anything special. Mm -hmm. Because all her friends were the same way. Now, I want to say something about that term ally. That gets on my nerves. And I know you didn't mean it that way. And it, we didn't use that term ally back then. And I say I wasn't an ally of the movement. I was part of the movement. Okay. Ha -ha. Okay. We supporters. We, we used the term supporters back then. Right. Folks from 
up north or something that were raising money or um, speaking on your behalf. But they weren't down there in the trenches with you. And I was down there in the trenches. So put some respect on your name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with it. You know, I can I can respect that. That 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 does have a different meaning when you say, "Look, I was I was a I was part of the movement. I was not an ally." Because to 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 say that you were an, an ally would would be to suggest that you know you were in more of a supportive role or, or a subordinate role. You're saying that I was in the trenches. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. I respect it. Now. I only was in the trenches when I, when I was doing things, I was invited by the leadership of the movement, the black leadership. Right. And, and do, you know. Um, some of the students at North Carolina College in the spring of 60 who were holding tickets and demonstrate sit-ins and things in Durham, North Carolina. Right. Came out to my, our campus to a Sunday evening fellowship and talked to us about what was going on, explained it, and then they invited us to join them in the demonstration. So some of us went. Freedom rides, got the phone calls, and okay. fighters. Every step of the way, I got involved in things I was invited into and took, I didn't take a leadership role. I followed what the leaders were saying to do. Right. That made a big difference too on, on how I was accepted in the movement. Speak more towards uh, Stokely Carmichael, because I, I had the opportunity to, to meet Stokely at Farrakhan's house once and uh, totally blew me away. And I only spoke with him briefly, but Stokely had a way of leaving an impression uh, with his words. I mean, he said he was like, he he didn't he wasn't a man who wasted words, <laughs> you know. Can you, can you speak toward more towards uh, Stokely as far as like maybe like an event you know that that you can recall or something that you know that involved him? Taking Stokely, getting Stokely in the South because he was part of the Howard University community um, sit-in group up this way mm -hmm. and. When the Freedom Rides had been stopped in Alabama and some of our Howard group were, were just as fast out the door as the Nashville crowd, and then they got, everyone was trapped in that church in uh, Montgomery, as King speaking, and every, each family unit or person could, I mean, there was the Klan and tear gas coming in the windows and everything. They could make one phone call of about two minutes each to, um, somebody to let them know they were okay. Well, one of our DC group called me and said, Joan, this is Paul, I can't talk. But a minute, we're trapped in the church in Montgomery, send more writers, click. So um, we got to get a few more folks together in DC to go down. And I was sort of, I don't know, Big in that, and I went a bunch of other folks to DC, and Stokely was one of those folks that we recruited to go out of our city in group. And um, so that was the main event I was involved in with him. Um, we we're in jail, of course, he didn't see each other in jail, and then when he got out of jail, he stayed to work like some other folks did on um, in the communities in Mississippi. And that's where that term freedom rider got twisted around because the former freedom riders working in the community were called the freedom riders still. And then any outsider who came to work in the movement became called a freedom rider. And now the term is sort of taken over. And I never know what people mean by freedom rider. But um, I didn't see Stokely hardly at all after that. But the few times I did, it was like, you know, best buddies over home week. Right. The end. But mom, there was a, a little incident on the train from New Orleans to Jackson. I'm, I'm with the Freedom Riders took the train from New Orleans. We flew to New Orleans and then took the train 
the Illinois Central, um, back to Jackson where we got arrested. And well, Stokely, you know, very New York, very New York. And um, in Yiddish or English, take the pick. We could read you out. And um, there were some college guys, white college guys on the train. Uh, they weren't saying anything too much, but they were making a couple wise tracks. And Stokely was right there in their face. And it was like, oh, Stokely, for God's sake, sit down and shut up before you get us killed. But he, he was typical Stokely, but nothing ever came to blows or anything. Right, right. Loki, yeah, Lo Lo Loki you, you, this, this movie that you have, this documentary, mm -hmm film that you've made uh, that's raising a lot of hell. Uh, can I say that uh, in front of Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's in the Bible, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Biblical terms. Yeah. So, so uh, the, the, the film, um, uh, The Uncomfortable Truth. Mm -hmm. In that film, you said, I could never do what my mom did. Right. Expound on that. Well, yeah, you know, I, I I say that often that I don't have to sit at the lunch counters because my mother did. Right? Right. I get asked that a lot. Would you have sat at the lunch counters? I'm like, honestly, it's a special kind of crazy to do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, there weren't that many people who did. And I don't know if I have that same fortitude that she does, just to be frank. Um, but, you know, but again, I don't have to because she already did. But I have to do what I could do because doing nothing is not an option. And yeah. So, and the thing about it is that even though you're you're operating in a different capacity, mm -hmm. you still are under attack. Not oh, yeah. the that your <laughs> was, but I'm sure that you get death threats, and I'm sure you get people that try to ostracize you and say, "Why are you doing this?" Yeah, but I've been accused of having absolute hate for the white race. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's always something stupid, but yeah. I'm not on, I wasn't on the clans. I'm not on the clans most wanted list like my mom was. But, right. but, but why, why, why is it that you alluded to this earlier? You were saying that how uh, that was a group of white guys who were, uh, you, know, you know, raping and, and doing whatever, but they were afraid more so of black people. Right. But the same thing that they're accusing black people of perhaps may try may may be trying to do but they haven't done it but these guys are actually killing raping pillaging right the country yeah. and, but but they're more afraid of the black man who they accuse of might or may try to rape and kill or pillage right how, how is it that consistently white guys and white people period sure a certain segment of white people who 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 are among the elite those politicians and business people and influential people in society who gets to determine the trajectory of society to an extent how is it that they're constantly able to uh manipulate white people especially poor white people yeah. that Black people are the enemy, and they're the friends. They they can be trusted. Trust me. Yeah. But those people over there, uh uh uh, uh how is it that they're able to consistently do that? Uh, well, because it's well, one is because you know we see this with Trump. Let's just be frank about this. He's he does the same thing. I'm one of you. I might be a billionaire, which he's not. I might be a billionaire, but I'm one of you. And so they 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 see that reflection of what they could be. And even though their lot in life sucks, like under Jim Crow, segregation, you know, was, uh, was, was more economic than it was racism. Racism was a piece that allowed segregation to continue because they can suppress wages, right? You might be poor, but at least you're not black. So as Levon says, follow the money. Like he says in the film, you know, Levon Brown, the freedom writer, right. just follow the money. Right, who was, who, was, who was an excellent choice to interview. Yeah, you know, he was phenomenal, I mean. But he, you know, so 
So, so under that system, so slavery ends, right? Now you got to pay these enslaved people who are now free. You got to pay them something, the law says. Mm -hmm. But we can't pay them too much because then the white people are going to want raises because they're white and, you know, we gotta, you know we've, always, we've always said they're better than blacks. Mm -hmm. But we, we don't want to pay them that much. So the little extra bonus they get is, well, at least you're not black, right? So we're going to let you, you know, we're going to let you, you know, kill a few of them if you want, you know, you can, you know, make them walk off the sidewalk, you know, the, all those sort of things. If you don't tip your hat or whatever, you know, we, get, we, we put all these things in place to make you feel superior, but you're still poor. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's this, this constant, then you play up to the fear of us versus them. And so then you get to things like, you know, uh, you know Red Summer, right? you get the Tulsa Greenwood district, you have successful towns, you have successful neighborhoods like the Black Wall Street, where it's, they're successful. And the reason they're successful is because you're not. The only reason, the only way a black man can be successful in America is he must have taken something from a white man. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And so and now, yeah. take your jobs, take whatever. Well, now I'm frustrated, I'm poor, you know, this is oppression, I'm going to burn them to the ground. Right. What we see today is in a similar tones is is, is with wage, wage suppression. We don't want to pay you $15 an hour, right? Now, they've convinced people out of their own best interest that getting paid a minimum wage of $15 an hour is, is, is bad. I, I know a guy who, who works at a place and he says, well, look, uh, he, he mixes ingredients at, at a, for lasagna, right? And he says, well, you know, they can't be paying those guys fl flipping burgers for $15 an hour. I said, well, why not? He says, well, that's just not fair. I said, you know, if they get paid 15 bucks, guess what you're going to get paid? Because you, you, clearly you think you're better than they are, right? He goes, well, yeah. I said, but they've convinced you out of your own self-interest to suppress those wages so they don't pay you more. That's all that's going on. Mm -hmm. And then... Well, now you got the horde coming in. You know, they got, you know, thousands of people are coming up from Mexico and stuff. They're coming to take your jobs. And I mean, what did Trump start with? When he came down the escalator, what did the first thing he say? You know, the Mexican, they give, they're giving us the worst. They're giving us the rapists. They're giving us their, th their thugs, right? And that's the same rhetoric you hear over and over and over again. It's that fear mongering. Um, and the irony is that and, and, and so on top of that, if I may, is, is the history. So you have to understand is that, is that white people have been instilled with this idea for centuries. And it's, and it's subtly passed on generation, generation. Yeah. Uh, and then you get people like my mom who uh, just don't buy it. Right. And that's the, you know, that dynamic change in our family trajectory. We just goes, this narrative just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's instilled in at churches. It's instilled at work. It's instilled in just the whispers, the jokes, the narratives in film, whatever it might be. And so, you don't even have to work that hard to convince them because it's already there. And, and it's even what you don't say in history books and education. So you don't elevate people of color in history books. Mm -hmm. So that all a white person sees is that a black person was was a slave. It, yeah, you throw them a few tokens here and there, you know, you got a Harriet Tubman, you know, or you got a Dr. King, you know, but, but beyond that, what do you really see of achievements of African Americans, you know, in history? What right. do white people see? Nothing at all. Yeah, that's why there's a mo major movement to rewrite those books and, you know, like a get rid of the books altogether and bring in new books because right. they have omitted a great deal of black history. Yeah. I was going to say earlier that the irony of Trump saying that they're giving us their worst is that he is our worst. Right. Big. <laughs> you know, in the film, you talked about having uh, your family owning six slaves. Mm -hmm. is, that some, is that history that you discovered yourself? Or is this something that your mom, Joan, is this something that you ever talked about? With, with slave owners, but I didn't know any of the details. Probably my mother okay from georgia um said more than i did yeah knew more than i did um and my father was actually from iowa so he didn't go along with that but they both come to washington for those big government jobs under roosevelt and just sort of agreed to disagree on 
racial racial matters. Right. Who 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 agreed? Your your mother and father agreed to disagree on racial matters. Yeah. And so, who was the aggressor here? Was you, uh, the affirmative here? Your your, your father. My father had no problem with black folks. He um, completely agreed with the goals of the civil rights movement. He just didn't want me to get hurt. And I see he grew up in this little small town in southwest Iowa, and the town doctor. I mean, you were talking maybe 600 people. The town doctor had a good buddy from his college days in Iowa. And this friend would come every now and again, and he'd bring peanuts, well, you know, fresh produce. You just didn't get that type of thing back in the day. Mm -hmm. And he had peanuts. And he would just throw them out in the grass for the kids to have a scavenger hunt. He was a hero to every kid in town. Now, who was he? Who would have been bringing peanuts? Yeah. Who, was, who was bringing peanuts? Yeah, who was the doctor's friend from his college days in Iowa? Black man, peanuts. Oh, um, 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 damn, damn, damn. <laughs> uh, don't tell me, don't tell me. Uh, let me see if I can, I can get it real quick. Damn, I just had it. Uh, Clint, Clint. You, you, you. Don't, George Washington. Carver, yeah. George Washington Carver, yeah. Carver, Carver, yeah, Carver, yeah. yeah. I had George Washington right. There you go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't you prejudiced, because you like those peanuts, don't you know? And that was my daddy's childhood hero. And he was a back before Superman and, you know, all that came on the stage. George Washington Carver was the hero to every kid in my daddy's hometown. So he was not prejudiced. What the talking about? Yeah.